Thank you, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Free Speech Project online. This is a collaboration of Future Tense, which is itself a collaboration of Slate, ASU, and New America, and the Tech Law and Security Program at American University Washington College of Law. We have a fantastic discussion um, slated for you all. We have two extraordinary panelists, um, David Kay and Kate Klonick. I will introduce them in a second. And just to give you a lay of the land, we are going to speak amongst ourselves for about 40, 45 to 45 minutes, and then we will answer your questions. So please send us your questions along the way, and I promise you will we will get to them all, or as many of them as we possibly can. Um, so um, Kate Klonick is a professor at St. John's University. She is an extraordinary writer and thinker on these issues. She's published many, many articles, including in Harvard Law Review, Yale Law Journal, The New Yorker, um, or she has a forthcoming article in, Leo, in the Yale Law Journal, and she's just um, really a, a brilliant thinker on these issues. So we're really lucky to have her with us today. And David Kay as well, another truly brilliant thinker and writer um, and leader on these issues as well, a professor of law at UCI, University of California in Irvine, also the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression. And I highly recommend his 2019 book called The Speech Police, The Global Struggle to Govern the Internet, um, which is really just a fantastic and clearly written and concise um, laying out of the issues and the struggles and the choices that we have to make. So um, I'm gonna jump right in. Um, and um, we hardly have a shortage of things to talk about here. Um, there is so much in the news right now, um, it's hard to know exactly where to begin. Um, but let's, let's start with, um, the relatively recent um, decision by Facebook to take down the Trump ad um, that included Nazi symbolism. Um, what do we make? What do you make of that decision? Um, and was it the right decision? Was it the wrong decision? Um, how is how is Facebook? You know, how do you rate the way Facebook is handling these these highly controversial issues? Um, David, I'll start with you. Great. Jen, thank you so much for that super kind introduction. It's great to see you. It's great to be on a panel with Kate. Hi, Kate. Nice to see you again. So, um, you know, for me, I, I think that if we are, um, if we get into a mode of constantly either criticizing or supporting specific actions of the platforms, we might not be in the right place because we might come out differently on on specific outcomes. So if, if we're talking about, um, right, in this most recent case, the use of, you know, basically a Nazi symbol to identify, uh, to identify um, political prisoners in concentration camps uh, during, during the Holocaust uh, and assigning that to, uh, to Antifa, basically, which is what I understand the ad to involve, you know, we could pretty clearly see that as, as problematic on many, many levels, but there's always gonna be different issues where, um, where we're gonna have some difference. And I think the fundamental problem is, is less about specific outcomes and more about two things. One, what is, the, what is the guiding principle or set of principles that they're using to make those decisions? And connected to that, how transparent are they about um, about those decisions and about those rules. And I think this has actually been one of the fundamental problems for the platforms over the years in that we, we have very little idea about how those rules are made. I mean, Kate has a better idea than anybody, I think. And yet when it comes to specific cases and how those are decided, we have very little insight into that. And to my mind, that that's more of a problem than you know, looking at very specific kinds of outcomes. Right. So I think one of the one of the critiques of of and then Kate will jump in, but one of the critiques of Facebook's um, approach in general with respect to political ads is that they are applying a different standard of political ads than they are to the rest of content on their platform. 
Um, and so, so Kate, what do you make of that? And um, you know, is that that's not? I mean, again, we can we can look at the specific, or we can we can look at the policies more broadly. Yeah, uh, thank you again for having having me, Jen. Uh, this is great. Uh, and yes, I also love talking with uh, David whenever I can get a chance and endorse his book, which is one of my favorites. Um, but so just to talk about, the, I think that David is absolutely right. Like just getting into the weeds of every single decision is just going to, we just feel like goldfish floating around a bowl, forgetting where we were three seconds beforehand. I feel like there is just, there just needs to be kind of, you have to move towards like creating transparency and consistency and kind of some level of accountability between users and the policies that guide them. And you're exactly right. The thing that really bothers me about the Facebook Facebook political ad kind of um, one of the things that bothers me about it um, is that once they just they for, first decided they weren't going to please political ads very openly um, and that was the level of like that's where they drew the line then they decided to change that then they decided to change that for Donald Trump and I think that there's one and I've written about this but like this is actually one of the things that bothers me the most which is that you know it's not even like they are particularly consistent with how they enforce these rules and against whom so we see over and over again um, kind of different types of figures getting treated differently depending on the speech that they're saying and depending on the speech that um, that that's being recapitulated online so I also want to kind of point out that like I have recently been in talks with some of my sources at Facebook, and there's definitely just like like subsets of individuals, public figures that are have their speech handled differently than than you or me, Jen. And it's a uh, I just don't think that that's exactly how we want to run the internet as to who they think are you know who like a bunch of people in Menlo Park think are worth keeping up or taking down, um, and so. That's really, um, oh, we lost Jen, um, but <laughs> there she is. Um, the, but that's really kind of, I think, the thing that strikes me as what we have to do going forward on these policies is create levels of accountability, or um, I think a better term for it is like participation from users in what the rules are that are governing them. Just let them have some say, um, because right now it's, you know, like a benevolent dictatorship in a lot of ways with Mark Zuckerberg, so. So I, can I just say really, I, just quickly to, to take off on that, because I think this point is really important. And, and Kate in her, I mean, to use the word that should be used, the seminal piece on platform governance, the new, to, to use the phrase she coined, the new governors, you know, these are platforms that have so much power and so much, you know, kind of a, a almost like a, a, a rule making function around them. And the opacity, the fact that, I mean, I think this is interesting news, really, that they have different approaches to different particular public figures. And then you layer on top of that the story that, you know, Ben Smith wrote about in the New York Times the other day about kind of secret meetings, which, of course, you know, corporate actors are always meeting with political figures, but it has a different kind of, of, of valence when we're talking about a company that manages so much of our political debate and has such influence. So I think Kate's points are, are really um, on target here. There's, it, it's, and it looks like a big mess when you have this inconsistency layered by you know, this kind of influence that seems unseemly. So I wanna, I wanna get back to both of those points and particularly Kate on the idea that people should have a say over this and talk a little bit more about what that means and what that could possibly look like. I just wanted to push back for one second before we go there on the political ads and public figure question. So um, as we all know, Twitter took a very, has taken a very different approach um, than Facebook. Um, but even Twitter, which um, has taken, for one, banned all political ads, but two, um, and even that creates a whole host of, com of questions about what counts as a political ad, which we can get into um, in a moment. But um, with respect to President Trump, at least, has taken a different approach in terms of fact-checking and 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 putting limitations on the retweet, in particular, of posts that were glorifying violence. But that said, they weren't treating him exactly the same. They kept the posts up, and to me, that seems like the right decision. So there should be some distinction between political figures and non-political figures, and that we, as a public, as a democratic as part of our democratic discourse, there's value in us 
knowing what those political figures say, but at the same time, you know, they shouldn't get away with just violating the rules that apply to both of us, to all of us, the rest of us. Yeah. So a couple interesting things I've recently learned, I think I've been underreported, is that it looks to us like all of this kind of this use of labeling on Trump's speech is something that uh, Twitter just kind of pulled out of a hat, like in the last couple of uh, weeks. But actually, since the Nancy Pelosi um, video, the one where she her speech was slurred down or slowed down, so she sounded like she was slurring her words. Um, since that, they've spent the last year, that was about a year ago, mid, late May of 2019, they've spent the last year serving over 6,000 people, uh, stakeholders and other people trying to figure out what people would have preferred rather than just simply removing Nancy Pelosi's, the Nancy Pelosi video. I also just want to flag really quickly that it's so, it's like you, when we talk about Nancy Pelosi's speech or Donald Trump's speech, uh, or the public figure nature or something. There is one set if you were the speaker uh, of, and a public figure, and another set if you're a target and spoken of and a public figure, and we're blurring all of those together. So like the fact that Donald Trump tweets something and doesn't necessarily post it on Facebook means that like, do, is it Facebook's job to take down the news stories that depict whatever, whatever it was that he said on Twitter? Um, th these are kind of just these co-mingling of issues that are really unclear but anyways to get back to twitter so they research all this stuff and what people told them and like and me and you're reflecting this jen is that they liked interstitials they didn't want it taken down they just wanted a little more context or the ability to go off and be told to go get more context right and so that's what the labels kind of kind of get at and i think that they're much better as you stated um, the other thing about the, the last thing I'll say and then turn it over to David, it's just the Twitter, um, the political ad ban on Twitter is so deceptive because their, their revenue from political ads is like one one hundredth of the revenue that Facebook uses for political. It costs Jack Dorsey nothing to make that like to make that statement. And he did it like three hours before Facebook's earning reports, meaning at the height of the political ad controversy. What people don't see is kind of that human aspect of like boys with toys running around in Silicon Valley doing this kind of thing. And I just think that that's, that's, a, it's a, that's a very important knowledge to know why, you know, to know how to question what some of these things are that we're getting when we do have transparency. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I also think that, you know, when one of the interesting things about the interstitials and and really the range of options that the platforms have, we, you know, we often, I think, at least in the public, the discussion is often a binary one, you know, leave up, take down, something like that. And, and we know that there's many different approaches, you know, there, that are algorithmic, that are, um, you know, related to, you know, what can be shared and what can't be shared, interstitials. So I think that, that actually a helpful part of the conversation over the last maybe six weeks or so has been to, to kind of highlight for people that we're not just talking about the binary, that there's different options. I mean, one thing I would say though, is that, you know, the, the material, the tweets that were taken, that were given these interstitials, these labels by Twitter, you know, they were, they were on the edge, I would say, and they were very problematic, but you can imagine others, other public figures, maybe not necessarily, you know, political leaders, but they could be civic leaders or others around the world who are actually inciting violence. And in those particular cases, there might be a really good case for a takedown, for actually deleting it and not making it available to anyone. But, you know, those are going to be the extreme cases, but that still has to be available to, to the companies. And it shouldn't be based solely on whether they're a public figure or not, precisely because it's the public figure that might be in a position to cause more harm. That's why the sort of the public figure aspect has been a little bit twisted, I think, because it doesn't, it's not really about the person, it's about the harm that they might be causing. I have plus one to that. I just think that that's exactly, that's exactly correct. And the, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these public figures and a lot of these world leaders, if they are call it, causing for, calling for harm or violence, are going to be able to amplify their message without Twitter's help without Facebook's help. They can get it out there, right? And it'll be like all over the news. And it is baby news that if you're doing that type of thing. 
but there's nothing to say that you know they have a right to that amplification. Um, I think that that's a I can't remember who said that if it was Rebecca McKinnon or if it was Dana Boyd, but someone at some point very early on was like, you have a right to free, to speech, you don't have a right to be amplified. And I think that's a nice thing to remind yourself when you're thinking about all of the different mechanisms in which we decide to adjudicate this type of speech. Great. So I think even just that discussion highlighted how hard these decisions are and how contextualized they need to be. So um, these are really tough decisions that require a lot of judgment calls about what someone's saying, how it's going to be perceived, what's the likely reaction, what's the relative value of allowing them to have for their speech to be out there versus the, the, the costs of, of taking it down. And so Kate, you said, let's let the people say, let's let the people, let's give all of us more voice in, in how these really hard and contextualized decisions are made. How do we do that? Yeah, so that people forget this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jen. I thought you no, finished. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> um, you know, I've been doing like these Zoom meetings for three months and I still like forget to unmute myself for like, the only thing I've gotten really good at is like not wearing like like wearing sweatpants all the time. <laughs> um, anyway, wearing sweatpants. Right <laughs> um, so I think that I think that that's a, a really great question. I don't think the answer to this is a referendum in democratic kind of a democratic form. I think that in fact what we see now and we have seen with Brexit and we've seen with various prop proposals out of California and all types of other things that like referendums are maybe not the best idea not to be a little so mad not, not to be super madisonian about it but um especially when you have such divergent views across the globe um and in 2009 facebook if anyone remembers did try kind of a referendum project direct voting on its st community standards and 0.32 percent of the facebook population showed up to vote uh, it was about 10,000 people out of 200 million Facebook users at the time. And so it was just seen as a colossal failure. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that going forward, what you need to start doing is having things like the Facebook Oversight Board make those kind of more standardized um, as means of uh, users getting redress on their speech that's taken down and or or like or being able to push back on the speech that is kept up that they disagree with being kept up um, and uh, and create like better user participation mechanisms. I don't know exactly what those look like. I, um, I but user participate like participatory democracy is kind of more the model that I'm speaking to than a tradition than like a like a direct democracy type of idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are those tools um, can be innovated. And, um, and they should be innovated. And I mean, I think one way we can think about it is, you know, we often think of the platforms, and I think this is certainly true of me, um, you know, we often think of them in our own space. Like we think of them, like what's the debate in the United States right now? And how are the, how are the platforms influencing it? And, you know, something like the oversight board might actually be helpful in integrating the views of, of a community, whatever that might be, um, sort of the broader public into those decisions and, and also highlighting what the sources of the, those decisions should be, like what, what standards are you drawing from? But I think one of the things that the platforms do pretty poorly is integrating public and community perceptions of the rules and their implementation around the world. They're much more in tune with the U.S. because they're all, you know, they're in Menlo Park or San Francisco or San Bruno. I mean, they, they're, you know, they're marinating in American culture and ideas all the time. But what about, you know, the 85% of Facebook's user base that is outside the United States? How do we integrate those views, their views, the public or the users in those places, their views so that the rules actually make sense to people? And I think that the companies have basically failed in that. And part of it is because there's, no, there's nothing like a case law system. You know, so we can just imagine you know, vast inconsistencies and inequities in decision-making. I, I don't know that that's true, but we also don't know either way because there's no set of, of rules. There's hypotheticals, there's you know, hard question blogs and stuff like that, but we really don't have the opportunity to overview, nothing wrong with the hard question blog. 
I love the hard question. It's, it's block. interesting, but it but and it gives us insight into particular problems, but it doesn't give us insight into the whole range of cases that especially people outside the U.S. I think would really benefit from, and then could integrate into the decision making. In some I don't. I don't get that, by the way, David. I wonder if you have insight into that, uh, or or if you do, Jen. Why eight to nine percent of Facebook's user base, which is based in the U.S., um, versus the rest of like the ninety percent that's everywhere else, and is the only percent that's growing, right? Like their global, mm. their pop, the people who are joining Facebook are people, and and increasingly depending on dependent on them through zero rating, kind of um, programs. Yeah are all in the global south. So why they're still setting their, it doesn't seem to make sense from a bottom line standpoint to keep, right? And I, so I just don't, I don't know what, I don't know what that is. Maybe Americans are richer and spend more money and the ads are worth more. I don't know, but like, that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is either. And it also, you know, feeds into the substantive questions of standards. You know, their standards are, you know, community guidelines, community stand, Twitter rules, all of those things, which are, you know, they're, they're company standards. And, you know, they've, they've kind of more or less, although putting, putting the political ads aside, there's been a lot of convergence, you know, and maybe on the margins in some areas, there's some differentiation, but there's been a, a lot of convergence around terrorism, extremism, hate speech, and those kinds of things. But, you know, if they actually rooted them in a vocabulary that people around the world understand, I agree. I mean, it would be a benefit to the companies. It's not, it's not a constraint. I, I agree. I don't, I don't get it either. Yeah. So David, you've, I mean, you've written about this a lot. What do you, what about the risk? I mean, so, so, I mean, I think one of the arguable benefits of this kind of, what you might say myopia, myopia is that most of the companies, and Kate, you've written about this as well, operate from a free speech promoting perspective. They don't always achieve that goal. And sometimes that goal conflicts with a whole host of other values and is not necessarily, um, you know, there, there's all kinds of reasons why sometimes just labeling that as the ultimate goal doesn't actually work. Um, but as you, as both of you have written about, um, and Kate and I, you and I wrote about this a little bit together, there's real risks of other countries that have much more repressive standards and rules coming in and shaping the speech across the internet via these companies that operate across state lines. So how, how does a company both do what I think is a very valuable goal of incorporating other perspectives and other contexts without running afoul of real concerns about censorship and repression yeah it's it's a great question kate you want to go first it's really good yeah no, go ahead. i mean the, the only thing i would say is and i think this would be we could talk about this for hours um the last couple of weeks or especially the last week have been really really interesting from the perspective of seeing other countries particularly in europe deal with speech questions you know the french constitutional court struck down basically a uh, you know the french hate speech law that had just been adopted a couple of weeks before they basically said it's unconstitutional and if you look at the decision it you know it, it it's in its own kind of constitutional language but it's basically making human rights arguments about why you know pressure on the platforms can't be applied in that particular way, you know, vague rules, et cetera, et cetera. Super interesting. There was also a decision by the European Court of Human Rights just today um, that struck down some Russian website blocking initiatives. And so, um, and there's been other cases over the last couple of weeks as well, which I think is interesting and also should be a signal that actually there are places around the world that do value freedom of expression but they implement those values and those rules in a different way. It's not that it's a better or worse way than ours, but one thing that you see in, those rule, in the rulemaking there is that these courts are saying, look, freedom of expression is a fundamental value in, in these cases in European space. In order to protect it and in order to ensure that that protection doesn't interfere with other rights, the rules need to look like you know, this, that, and the other it's actually pretty sophisticated. And I think Americans would really do well to look at that and say, well, maybe either as companies are adopting their own rules or as the US is thinking about like what our own regulatory strategy might look like, we can actually learn quite a bit from, from this recent you know, European case law. Super interesting stuff happening. 
Yeah, I was so excited by the, the by the French court. And I, Jen, I'd actually love to hear you talk about it because you probably are maybe more familiar with it than um, than I am. But uh, I, I thought that that was great. I will just say really quickly that I think that the free speech policy you're kind of speaking of and the, the way that the companies decided to set their standard there was because it matched both the, the moments when early on in internet history from like Google and YouTube and, and Facebook um, from like, I would say like the first decade of 2000, of like 2000, 2010. And, but, but still now, I mean, we see it with Facebook just fighting back against the, about, in the case that we wrote about, Jen, um, in the uh, Austrian defamation case. You see a pushback that is very free sp speech oriented from the companies against nation states. Let's put it that way. And then if they can apply that same type of policy, that free speech, keep it up type of policy against users, then there's like, it was like a comfortable, easy consistency. Mm -hmm. I think that when they started between like Boston Marathon bombing, at least at Facebook, Boston Marathon bombing to the Napalm Girl incident in like 2013 or 2016, 2016, that there was basically, um, you had a slow disintegration into trying to draw lines around newsworthiness and um, other types of things and take down, um, take down more speech. And I think that there was a monolithic approach of basically like, well, we'll get in the, like people are gonna be more upset if we keep speech up, they probably won't be as mad if we take speech down that flipped around the Boston Marathon bombing. And that is like, that was like completely blown out of the water and like has kind of changed the entire way um, the companies have dealt with things going forward. But you kind of see it in the various iterations of again, the human side of who's working at the companies and when and what policies they put forward at what point, much like a Supreme Court might do, right? And like whoever, you know, whoever the Roberts Court versus, you know, like the Marshall Court. So I just, I think that this is, uh, it's something, you know, it's just a very, we forget that that's exactly what's going on. So let's talk about courts. Um, we, you've, you both mentioned the Oversight Board, which Mark Zuckerberg at one point um, compared to the Supreme Court or the Supreme Court of Facebook. Um, and so Kate, before we get into it, um, you've, you've obviously studied this more than just about anybody. Do you mind just giving all the listeners just to the very brief lay of the land in case not everyone is as familiar with it as, as you clearly are? Um, yeah, it's a ignominious distinction to like, <laughs> I'm going, I'm like no one has spent nearly as much money and gotten paid less than me um, <laughs> following Facebook around. Um, but the, uh, the oversight board is really something that has is the product, uh, the 2018 kind of um, brainchild of uh, formerly Noah Feldman and then uh, was adopted by Mark Zuckerberg and he put into action. But it was something that people had promoted as an idea for, for the decade before that. People have been talking about having an appeals, court of appeals. Rebecca McKinnon talked about it. Daniel Citron talked about technological due process. Um, they've been, there's been long been kind of discussion around creating more due process in these systems. And so there is, uh, in 2018, um, Mark Zuckerberg basically decided that he was going to really kind of make a firm commitment to building out an independent oversight board that would review speech that was removed and kept up, that users flagged. Okay, so let me start over. It would remove speech that users flagged, um, and they could then appeal the decision that Facebook made on whether to remove that content or to take it down or whether to keep it up. And they could um, review that to this board, appeal to this board. And then you had, I mean, that sounds like, okay, that's a fairly straightforward thing. You're gonna have this court of appeals like the Supreme Court, but it actually ended up just being, and that's kind of what I spent the last year researching while I was there. It's an incredibly difficult question of how you draw the jurisdictional lines of what Facebook is actually going to do with the court, with the um, oversight board's decisions, what you're going to have them, um, what you're going to have them uh, look like. Are they going to look more like a representative body or more like a court? Are they going to, you know, how long are their terms going to be? How will they select cases? How will they hear cases? Will they be anonymous panels? Will they write decisions? Like all of these things. Um, and so right now um, there's about 20 people on the oversight board. Uh, they started in May 6th, May 7th. Uh, that was like kind of the official launch, so to speak, of like naming all the members. And um, they will are slated to be kind of ramped up and hearing cases from individuals by September. 
and they have said that they will hear cases first from users that have like have appeals to be heard um but they in within their jurisdiction um facebook can go and ask them um for policy decisions uh that it wants and so there's lots of there's tons to talk about with this why did facebook do this why did you create an external independent board is it independent um it you know is it going to be effective? Is it, does it have any power? Is it a Potemkin village? Is it really a court? Is it, you know, this, all of this other stuff. And there's lots to discuss, but it has been, and I've written, I said that at the very least, it is one of, it is a small, small step toward the participatory system of users. It's a very small step, but it's more than we have right now. And so as an advocate for online speech, I'll take it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions on that. I, yeah, I think that I think Kate and I come out in a similar place in terms of, you know, the debate when they first announced the the first 20 uh, panelists, I think there was a lot of, you know, some very serious criticism of it. And I think we're both in the same place of, you know, it's a positive step, or it is at least a step that isn't, it's not harmful, um, in my view. And um, let's see what it can actually do. But in terms of what it can actually do, I do think we need to be realistic about it. You know, it's it's pretty limited. Um, it's it's going to be kind of constrained by the fact that you know there's you know a couple of billion users and only 20 panelists and a relatively small kind of secretariat that'll that'll staff it up. So they're not going to be able to to deal with all of the different kinds of appeals that people have. It's gonna be kind of a policy level cut. I, I would think of it that way. It's almost like we were talking about the hard questions blog. It's gonna be like a hard questions appellate body in a way. And it will be just as accessible, maybe even more accessible to Facebook to ask the questions as it will be to users. So, you know, I think we just need to be realistic about it. And I also think that you know, over over time, and I guess this is more my hope than anything else, over time, the board will actually push uh, the the company to to change the standards that it has. And, and there will be debates. I mean, there will un, undoubtedly be a kind of Marbury moment where Facebook says to the board, you know, you're exceeding your ability to review our decisions. And, you know, when that happens, I think that's where it's going to be most interesting, right? That's going to be the moment where, and depending on what the issue is, where we're going to see, is this board for real? Is it a real constraint on Facebook? Or is it something that is kind of on the margins, helping, helping the company make uh, particular decisions? I don't think we know that yet. And until that happens, I mean, I would reserve judgment and think that, and just sort of look at like, well, what is it actually um, going to be doing? And it'll be very interesting to see if it has that kind of impact on the company. So let me ask about a critique that's often kind of leveled against this, the board, which is that the board is reviewing particular decisions based on the standards and policies that Facebook itself has put forward. And my understanding is that the board's opinions with respect to decisions are binding, particular cases are binding but the board's broader recommendations with respect to the underlying policies and standards are advisory. Um, and so if that's the case, and given how few cases relative to the demand this kind of board is going to hear, like, is that, is, is that gonna really move the needle? Are we, do we, I mean, I, I get that it's better, it may be better than nothing, but, um, I guess I'm coming at this with a bit more skepticism, I think, than either of you have expressed so far. No, I think that the, the skepticism is completely warranted. Like I said, this is very, it's even smaller, it's, honestly, Jen, it's even smaller jurisdictionally than you're describing because the binding, the, the bindingness of the decision is for that one specific piece of content, not for content like it, not for content that looks exactly like to get reposted by anyone else. It is only good for like if David has like a picture of his like dog up and it's removed and he wants to be like, you know, you, you know, like I want this back up. They like, and I post a picture of his dog, like they will only take down, um, they will only take down, um, they will only reinstate um, David's picture, not mine. Um, and so that's like, that is like almost nothing. But the advisory 
the advisory um, capacity is, and a lot of people have written about this, including Evelyn Duick at Harvard, who's brilliant on this also, and has covered it almost as deep, like pretty much as deeply as me, but from like not been inside as much, um, is that this is really a form of weak form review. That by kind of uh, allowing the board to have any power and to exist at all, you kind of can't really keep the genie in the bottle. And eventually, as David describes, you will slowly have more and more feedback that is publicly announced and thus creates immense like public relations pressure on Facebook to basically uh, either, and I should also say they have, they're first to respond to the, all of the policy advice. So they have 30 days to respond every time the board gives them any type of advisory opinion. And that's also like really important if, you know, and I think that that's, I think that those two things are, like I said, more than we've ever had before. We, you know, you still have to kind of consider that it's a private company. And I, I think that it's capacity to, in a way, almost shame the company uh, into taking certain decisions or to applying certain rules is something, first of all, we don't know that, that capacity quite yet. But I think um, in a way, it's not totally clear to me that, you know, that Mark Zuckerberg knew what he got himself into. Because you know, once you create this body, and again, we don't know the impact, but once you, once you create the body and once it starts making decisions, if those decisions are kind of pushing the envelope on issues like human rights standards, on issues, you know, even, you know, algorithmic and other kinds of issues that the company might be uncomfortable about, uh, you know, the, the board going in that direction. If the board goes in that direction and, and really pushes forward and the company uh, resists, I mean, that creates a whole new, you know, whether we call it public relations or something else, it, that'll be a very serious problem for Facebook. Now, I don't know if that'll happen, it might not happen. It could be that the board is, you know, is pretty modest. But when you look at the people who are on the board, you know, at least, you know, the, I would say, you know, eight to 10 who I know, that, that's not their MO usually. Like they will, they will push. It'll be interesting to see how successful they are and how public that, also, that is. And that was also a huge question is that it was all being kind of formed out or formed in the last year was like how serious the people would be. Should it be a blue ribbon kind of panel of people that weren't going to actually have time to devote to these issues like you know all of these things and I agree with you I think that the MO of most of these of most of the people that are on the got selected to be on the board is one that's going to be pushing for Marbury a Marbury type decision sooner rather than later yeah so here's a one question from an audience member is it a, is it a good thing that the oversight board will hear cases anonymously yeah, I saw this question. This is a great question. It was heavily debated. Um, the reason that they're hearing them in five person panels anonymously is for security reasons, because they're concerned, and I think maybe rightfully so, um, that there what that like that they would there would be targeting of certain board members uh, if the specific cases they were hearing where it was public. Um, that said, it's going to be kind of interesting because they are not. Uh, they're allowing dissents. Um, so you're going to have kind of an anonymous dissent and then a per curiam opinion, um, which will be, I think, kind of, just, I don't know, it'll just be interesting. What do you think, David? I'd rather it not be anonymous. I mean, I don't, I actually think that the, look, I mean, one of the restrictions on the board that, that we haven't totally addressed is, you know, it's not going to be dealing with government, like legal demands. So for example, if, you know, if Turkey makes a demand on Facebook to take down content, it, my understanding is that that's not a part of, that's certainly not Facebook's intention, that that would be something that the, the oversight board could adjudicate, right? Those legal demands are somewhere else. So those are the kinds of cases that I think might raise actual, you know, kinds of security issues for people, not necessarily the kinds that we're going to see. So I mean, my, my inclination is to say, I'd rather have more information. I'd rather people, you know, just as, you know, with courts outside of military tribunals around the world or security uh, panels around the world that occasionally do their justice anonymously, which is almost always problematic. Um, I would rather it be uh, more publicly accessible and for people to, to debate in, in that way. It's a lot harder when your judge or your panelist here 
is anonymous to the outside. I think that could, but, but I also understand there are some risks to, to doing that. Yeah, so just, so I want to broaden the lens a little bit. David, you started very early on in the conversation, you talked about the need for, or the concern that, that all these decisions are made behind closed doors and there's no precedent, there's no publicity. So, so this, we've talked about, this might be a small step for a single company on the margins. How can we think about designing systems and oversight that would work across companies and really do that on a meaningful way? And you know, I'll just from where I come from, it's th these are such hard choices because if you put that decision in the hands of a, any sort of governmental official entity, that raises a whole host of legitimate concerns, I think. Um, yeah. but anyway, it, these are really, it, it seems like a really, really hard design question. And so um, I know both of you have thought about this a lot, so I'd love your thoughts. Yeah. I, so I would, maybe two responses. One, just on the oversight board generally, and you know, the idea of it being self-regulation, um, that, that should not be a replacement for other kinds of oversight. So like the self-regulation of an oversight board, from my perspective, should be seen as a company implementing its responsibilities under the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights to ensure that they're not having a negative effect on the rights of their users or on the public. Every company should have something like this. And, and you know, for that reason, it should be guided by human rights standards. To me, that seems, and that's, that's not limited to the tech sector. That's a lot of multinational companies that have very grave impacts on human rights. Um, and we could have a you know, much longer discussion about that. So I think that's one thing. All companies should be doing something like this. As far as the you know, kind of a cross industry oversight, I actually think that you know, Article 19 and a few others, the organization Article 19, you know, have proposed and have been working on this idea of a social media council, which the, the lingo comes from uh, press councils, which are kind of common in the Commonwealth and in other places around the world, where you, you don't want the government to be evaluating, for example, what a media outlet uh, publishes or not, but having some kind of, you know, civil society and company body to evaluate real hard questions around content. Is, is appropriate. And I think there could be a cross-industry approach similar to the one that Article 19 is suggesting that at least says, here are human rights standards. You know, we have user-generated content having a significant impact on human rights, sometimes um, sort of promoting human rights, sometimes interfering with them. And if you have this as a cross-industry, multi-stakeholder approach, you know, you could actually have some ways to increase transparency, increase public participation, and so forth. And I think the ideas around this are pretty, are pretty rich and sophisticated, but they've hardly been discussed beyond kind of a narrow group at, at, at the moment, despite, I mean, the real efforts of Article 19 and Stanford and some others uh, to, to make that happen. Yeah, I, I agree with, I, that's totally what I'm thinking as well, so. <laughs> So we've made it this far without mentioning Section 230, um, which is oh, shocking. <laughs> but I don't think we can have this conversation without talking about the possibility and the effect and, and the potential need for Section 230 reform as a means for putting external forms of accountability on the platforms to do things um, that there's that the platforms are not doing sufficiently on their own whether it's not sufficiently taking down harmful speech or not sufficiently responding to malicious foreign interference although a whole host of things that a lot of harms are being shoehorned into let's reform 230 and that will help solve the problem so does 230 need to be reformed will that help is that the kind of kind of oversight and accountability that that is needed in this particular moment um so I've been hosting a, uh, a daily webinar that's 90 minutes uh, doing five different, um, five different discussions from five different panels of people with different perspectives on Section 230 about this very question. Um, but I will just broadly say that there are cer there's certainly some room for a smart 
uh, Section 230 reform. I think that it could be brought in so that it's not just applying to fem federal criminal law is like certainly one of like the, mo the lowest hanging fruit. But um, I think that it is weirdly such a misunderstood law and what it, as to what it can and can't do um, or will and won't do. And one of the biggest examples that I gave today um, when I was doing, we were doing the seminar was basically that um, I think that there is a strong probability that if you struck down Section 230, that um, that a, that courts would hold that platforms have their own First Amendment rights that uh, prevent them from being um, from causes of action on communication torts from uh, that protect them to basically decide who comes up and who goes down and like that's that's co totally on them. The difficulty I think that'll be so stupid about getting rid of 230 is that we just don't have much First Amendment law around this because of Section 230. And so you're going to have this entire kind of slow iteration through the courts of kind of breaking out like how exactly the First Amendment creates like pockets of immunity from communication torts. Uh, and it just feels like reinventing the wheel when we don't need to. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's one layer of it. There's the entire FCC admin layer. There's other types of things. But I just think that, um, I mean, the, the other thing to, to David's point about speaking outside the United States is the Section 230 is the United States law. It applies to it within the borders of the U.S. It does not, it, Section 230 doesn't exist in other, in other jurisdictions. And the and the platforms have managed to thrive and get along just fine. So I think that this is kind of, it's something to keep in mind when you kind of have the, the sky is falling, Section 230 is going to go away. And you have um, kind of people who think that, uh, uh, you know, this is the only thing standing between um, a better internet uh, is getting rid of Section 230. I just don't think, I don't think either of those perspectives have it right. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that this, I won't say much about 230, but I think that, you know, we are being myopic if we focus only on 230. And, and if we only get our learning when we're talking about intermediary liability from 230, I mean, in Europe, they have the e-commerce directive, which, you know, has, it's, it's, has a variation to it, but it basically immunizes the companies from all sorts of liabilities, much as, as Section 230 does. And, you know, in Europe right now, the European Commission is considering a kind of a massive revamping of internet law uh, across Europe. It's going to be hugely, I don't know if I'd say disruptive, but it's going to make a big impact in Europe, maybe to a similar extent as the GDPR on privacy has uh, in European space. And that means it's going to have a big impact on on US users as well, because you know these companies operate at scale. So if they're forced to make some pretty significant changes in Europe, they're probably going to do them at scale, you know, and implement these across the board. So I, I actually think we should be doing some educating of ourselves on what the Digital Services Act in Europe is going to mean for internet regulation around the world, in the United States and elsewhere. And we're, I think we're not even really having that, that discussion, but it's going to be a big impact on us. And I think that you know, as we move forward and we think about Section 230, I think we should also be thinking about like non-content focused forms of, of regulation, you know, transparency kinds of things, disclosures. Like we, we haven't even scratched the surface of what's possible without getting into, you know, undermining First Amendment rights in the U.S. Yeah. What should we, what should we know about that law, David? The European about the DSA. Yeah, yeah. I don't know yet. I mean, seriously, I you know what? I think what's interesting is so far what we've seen in terms of the draft coming out from Europe is that they actually, at least the current leadership of the European Commission, does not want to undermine sort of fundamental principles of intermediary liability, um, in part because they see that the platforms as as much harm as they might see them causing, they also see that they have so much, they have, they, have, they have so much power over public space that could be for the good. I mean, I think some of the people at the commission really do believe that. And so they're looking for a way to protect that, that kind of uh, public space that is good for public debate while also dealing with the harm. I mean, I think that's appropriate. It's gonna be super hard to do um, but I think we, we should all be engaging in it 
at least observing what's happening because it's going to be it you know given the fact that we're so dysfunctional in washington it's likely that you know brussels is going to make a move well before we're in a position to do anything and i would just say that that's like this interesting type of governance that is happening from outside the u.s borders which is just kind of the brussels it is like literally the brussels effect or like the california effect or whatever you want to call it but like the idea that you have a large market share and in order to um you decide to cater to the largest mar market share uh, which europe or california or texas um and then you know and then if you're a company, then extrapolate your policy off of that and not make separate little pockets. Like Rhode Island doesn't get to set like policy for the rest of the world. Um, uh, and neither does like Lithuania all by itself, you know, all by itself. It's just like, these are kind of iterative um, things. And so I just kind of wanted to point that out that it's this, it's this, um, we're kind of just seeing that play out over and over again in these private spaces. I, I, I completely agree with that. I, I also think it's slightly complicated by the fact that there is the possibility and the reality of geoblocking on the platforms, which does allow them to provide slightly different user experiences in different contexts. Um, and that is one way that companies have and continue to do kind of mediate different norms and approaches across borders as well. Um, I want to turn to another audience question, which was, um, we've talked a lot about um, political ads, we've talked about, about user generated content, but this is a question about um, foreign interference and what are, what are the social, are the companies doing enough to deal with foreign interference, particularly in our elections? And what can we do to help hold them more accountable if we think that they're not doing enough? Yeah, it's so I don't know if I could say that they're doing um, enough. They're doing better. Um, there's no question that they're doing better than they, they once were. Um, but, you know, I guess I'm, I'm afraid of a couple of things. One is the kind of whack-a-mole issue. You know, the problem is that there are a few governments that are extremely sophisticated um, and it's not, it's not just governments, you know, it's also, you know, domestic actors that are extremely sophisticated and attuned to how to game the platforms. And, and I think that that exists with, you know, regardless of the level of transparency of the companies. And so it's, you know, it's a constant game, I think, and it's, a, you know, a pretty high level game of dealing with bad actors on the platforms. And, you know, whether they're always succeeding, you know, it, it's hard to say. Um, there's still a very high level of disinformation on the platforms. There's, there is some, I mean, there's certainly better transparency than there used to be but there's not full transparency in terms of, of what they're doing and what they're seeing. There's, um, you know, as far as uh, disinformation and government manipulation outside the United States, it's still, I think, black boxed in a way that um, like the Russia US issues are, are more open to us than in the past. But, you know, what say Twitter or Facebook are doing with respect to Saudi manipulation, which is pretty significant, very hard to very hard to know. So I think there's still a very significant transparency problem there, as, as sort of at the least. I'll just I'll just add that the people that there has been a brain drain in the last four years from people working in cybersecurity and government to to the best people leaving to go to work for the platforms because they pay more because they've had this urgency of creating an answer to this problem. And so if, I don't know, again, I don't know, I guess doing, and I agree with David, I don't know about the language doing enough, um, but doing more probably, unfortunately or fortunately doing more than, um, doing more than probably most governments can do right now and having kind of the reach and the data to do that. Um, I just, I think that they are well motivated to, to shut this down. I do not, I think that, again, for better or worse, that I do not think that Facebook wants, an, Twitter wants another 2016 election. They do not want another, like a Brexit. Um, I just don't know. I don't know that they can, I don't think they can avoid being regulated if they, if they, if they kind of, if they leads clearly to one of those and they slept on the job or there's some type of negligence at the heart of like why why one of those events happens again. So that's, that's kind of my, my main takeaway. I, I'm curious about it maybe before we move off, because I think this is sort of, um, Kate, your point here, 
made me think of this issue. I'm wondering what you and what Jen think about this. Um, it seems like over the last several weeks that we've almost had like a red state and a blue state platform, you know, and, you know, Facebook is, is being perceived as being friendly to Trump, or at least, um, you know, more, more willing to accept, obviously, Trump ads and stuff like that, and maybe more kid gloves. And then there's the story about the private dinner, you know, with Peter Thiel involved and all that. And then you have Twitter, which is labeling and so forth. And I'm wondering how you see that implicating the regulatory environment. Uh, let's say, you know, we have a Biden administration in January. Is it going to have an impact on, on, on sort of what Washington does? Um, or is it, is it all going to be a wash? I mean, I think that the, I think that, I mean, you have Biden coming out in favor of regulating the platforms along or and getting rid of section 230 along with Josh Hawley. It's a very straight, like, I actually don't know, honestly. Like, I think that that is fascinating. Like, that is fascinating to me that you have Josh Hawley calling for abolishing 230 and you have Joe Biden calling for abolishing 230. As I've said about 230, it has this weird way of like, takes everyone so from so far on the right and so far on the left to meet each other and like this decision to kind of come like to take down this law. Um, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. There are certainly, I think a lot of it is going to happen in how the press plays out the election and how the press plays out the, the, um, the platforms. Um, I don't know how Facebook wins if it keeps, uh, if it keeps having to make these calls. Um, and this is in particular one of the reasons that I am hopeful about the oversight board, because I think that they are well motivated to use the oversight board because the oversight board means that these crappy decisions of having where no one is happy at the end of the day about what speech stays up or what speech comes down are all um, all kind of land in make it someone else's problem and that someone else is the oversight board. So I think that that's kind of where I where I think this will go, but I don't know what Jen thinks. So I would just say that I think, I mean, I think the whole notion of Washington attacking a platform for its either conservative or liberal bias is, is a low point. And we saw that in um, the underpinnings of the Trump's EO um, executive order on these issues on 230 and more. And um, I would just, I would hope and certainly expect that a Biden administration would have a different tack on at least that particular issue. Um, but I will just end. Um, we have, I've, there's again, there's too many qu amazing questions that I would like to get to. We have run out of time. Um, I know um, our panelists have to jump off, um, but I would just thank both Kate and David for really a fantastic conversation. I would like to thank our audience members. Um, I would like to um, inform and remind our audience members who don't yet know that there is going to be a fantastic conversation next week, same time, same place, with Anne-Marie Slaughter, um, the CEO of New America, and LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman on 2020, How Will It Ch Change American Tech? Um, so I encourage all of you to join for that. And please join me um, in thanking our panelists um, and in thanking Future Tense Slate ASU um, for helping host this um, along with our program, the Tech Law and Security Program at American University. Thanks.